All right, this is State of Wisconsin versus Ezra J. McCandless, Dunn County case, 2018 CF 125. Appearances, please. Your Honor, the state appears by Dunn County District Attorney Andrea Nodolf and Assistant Attorneys General Richard Dufour and Peter Hahn. Ezra McCandless appears in person and with her attorneys Aaron Nelson and Deja Vishnu. All right, counsel, are we ready to bring the jury in? Your Honor, there's one uh, issue that uh, I didn't think was an issue uh, when I started my direct of uh, uh, Detective Proc, uh, but uh, after meeting with him last night, uh, may become an issue, and that's uh, the scope of cross examination relating to the March 1st interview. Uh, I understood it from uh, the conversation we had before. Detective Proc got on the stand that uh, Attorney Nelson was only going to cross-examine him on uh, briefly on that interview related to the areas that I covered. Uh, but Detective Proc indicated that uh, at least for sure there were going to be questions relating to other areas. And it's our position that uh, the rule of completeness does not allow uh, questions relating to anything that is unrelated to the four very distinct and very discreet areas that I covered on uh, direct, and that is uh, that uh, the defendant had deleted all of her messages between herself and John Hansen, uh, that she stated that she was still in love with John Hansen, that she had a sexual Jason relationship. Mangle. Jason Mangle. Or, I'm sorry, Jason Mangle, yes, thank you. Uh, that she had a sexual relationship with Alex Woodworth and it was consensual and that uh, there was a third person present at the time of uh, the incident with Hanson, and that being Hanson's roommate. All right, Mr. Nelson. Um, I do intend to take up things during my cross-examination. When I spoke with Mr. DeFore, I did not intend to mislead him. If I did, I apologize. I do not intend to play the recording based upon what Investigator Proc testified, I believe that there is a minute portion of that recording that I should be able to do to impeach him regarding what Ezra told him about Alex. If we want to get into the details of that now, or if we want to get into the details of that during the break, because I know he's probably going to be on the stand for a couple of hours, but there is that one portion regarding testimony that was elicited um, and that I want to bring out. Uh, other portions of my cross-examination involve non-hearsay matters, that is, what Investigator Proc told Ezra McCandless at the end of that recording as it goes to, first off, it's not hearsay, and second off, it's relevant because it goes to her state of mind uh, and what she may or may not have done after that and how it may or may not have related to his next interview and any failure to investigate other matters. And so I don't think they're hearsay. I'm not trying to do it from the rule of completeness. And if you want to take that up now, I can go to more. But I, if, if that's the only thing that's going to be gone into, first off, I agree. I mean, I agree. You can play a portion of the recording if it relates to uh, one of the areas that I covered. And if that's the only other portion of the interview that he intends to ask him about, then I don't have a problem. And, we'll, All right. we'll and, uh, and Mr. Nelson, when you say what Detective Proc said was not hearsay, are you saying it was not hearsay by rule? I, I believe he's saying it's not being uh, introduced to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Okay. Well, let me look up the... It's definitely... That's not what I understood. Let me just... I apologize. I'm going to go look up the law quick, but... definition of hearsay. I don't believe it fits the definition of hearsay because he's testifying 
uh, I also uh, believe the state previously uh, declared here in open court that uh, Mr. Brock was essentially should be allowed in the courtroom because he is uh, he represents the state and so it may fall under an admission by a party opponent as well um, but lastly uh, if it's not a, it, it's a residual hearsay exception under the uh, 24 we have an actual recording of what he said so from a from that standpoint, we know what he said. He's on the stand. He can be cross-examined. Um, I guess in the end, if the I think I can offer for the truth of the matter. So I guess I'd like that analyzed first. Well, if they're introducing it for the truth of the matter asserted, then it is hearsay. It's a prior statement. It doesn't matter if the witness is on the stand. It's still hearsay. It's still a prior statement. You can't. You can introduce a prior statement if it's a prior consistent statement or prior inconsistent statement of a witness, but just because they're a witness doesn't change the fact that what they said before is hearsay. Uh, it's still hearsay. So if they're only introducing it to show knowledge that the defendant had, that's not hearsay because not being introduced to prove the truth of the matter asserted. But if they are introducing and want to introduce it for the truth of the matter asserted, then it's hearsay. And just because it's recorded doesn't change it from being hearsay. You know, that, that doesn't make it residually, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, give it residual uh, indicia of reliability. Uh, all that does is tells us, yeah, that's what they said. That doesn't prove that what they say is true or not true. Uh, so that doesn't add residual indicia of reliability. All right. Well, why don't we do this? Let's, uh, let's bring the jury in. Let's uh, continue on with the direct and uh, in the break, and we can address those issues a little bit further. It'd be uh, helpful to know, again, what, what that statement actually was. Frankly, the court does know what the statement is. Um, and this is, I'm uh, assuming from the investigation related to John Hansen, end of that interview. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Nelson? Correct. I statements that Mr. Proc made to Ezra McCandless on March 1st, 2018 okay. in that recorded interview. Correct. All right. And if maybe at some point here, you know, in some way, get me that statement so I can I guess, see what it is. Okay. Before cross-examination, we'll take up those issues. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, let's bring the jury in. Detective Proc, I want to talk to you, ask you a couple questions relating to the March 20 third interview that we uh, heard yesterday afternoon before we broke for the day. Uh, did you ask the defendant where, if she knew where Alex was at that time? Yes, I did. And what did she tell you? She did not know where he was. Did you, uh, did the defendant at any point in time during the interview uh, state that Alex Woodworth was attempting to sexually assault her on March 22nd? No. Did she uh, tell you uh, that her father did not want her driving uh, at that time? Yes. Who did the uh, defendant, if, if she said it at all, uh, say wanted to talk on March 22nd? Uh, she advised Alex wanted to talk with her. And did she tell you uh, who, uh, if anyone, wanted to talk someplace other than Alex's apartment? Uh, she did. She said that she suggested going to a park, possibly Owen Park. Did you ask her where Alex's phone might be? Yes, I did. What did she tell you? Uh, she told me that it was possibly back at in his apartment inside his room because he uses it as an alarm clock. Now, did you ask her about if she had been in an accident on March 22nd? Yes, I did. And what did she tell you about that? Uh, she told me she was not involved in an accident. Did she tell you why she was so sure she wasn't involved in an accident when she couldn't remember anything much of anything? Uh, because she said she would remember if she was involved in a car accident. Did she say why she believed that? 
uh, because she's been in them before. And did she say what she remembered about the accident she'd been in before? Yes, she remembers all of her accidents and what they were involved in. Now we talked a little bit about uh, some of the things you did after that interview uh, to try and find Alex. Did at some point in time you decide you were going to return to the Dunn County uh, area where uh, the defendant uh, was observed or went to Mr. Sipple's residence? Yes, we did. All right. And why did you decide to go back to that area? After speaking with her and going through all the reports, it, it wasn't making sense where she came from and that Alex wasn't located or even her vehicle. Um, not being familiar with that area, uh, myself and the other detectives wanted to go put our, actually see it and just double check to see if she was in an accident or if they were in a ditch or in a creek or crashed or to see if we can find something that might lead us in a direction of where this incident took place. Right. Uh, and so did you go to that area? Uh, yes, we did. Who else went? Uh, myself and Detective Groyle were in one vehicle. Sergeant Piper was in a vehicle. Detective Wuchke and Detective Streeter were in a third vehicle. All right. And what was the plan? What were you and Detective Groyle going to do initially? Uh, myself and Detective Groyle were going to go up and speak with Mr. Sipple um, just to see if we can get any more information from him to get an idea of which direction she possibly traveled from. Right. And as you drove there, were you going at highway speeds or were you going slower than that? Uh, we're probably going right around speed limit, if not slower, um, checking ditch lines, checking parking lots, checking really anything to see if we can find a vehicle that matches hers. And did you get to uh, Mr. Sipple's residence? I did. And did you start to speak with him? I did. All right. At some point in time, uh, while you were speaking to Mr. Sipple, were you notified to come back to an area a little bit closer to Eau Claire than the Sipple residence? I was. And how did that happen? Um, as Detective Groyle and I were talking with Mr. Sipple, uh, Sergeant Piper called and said that he had located um, footprints in the mud road that was just down from Don Sipple's house. All right. And did you go to that area? Uh, we did. All right. And did you walk back to where uh, the defendant's vehicle was found, as we've heard about it? Yes, I did. Right. Uh, once you got to that scene, did you do anything to alter the scene prior to Dunn County or law enforcement arriving on scene? No. All right. And did you observe anybody else do anything to alter that scene? No one went inside the scene. All right. Uh, since uh, this uh, incident and since March 22nd of 2018, uh, have you attempted to drive the route uh, from the uh, uh, from Alex's uh, apartment to the scene where the uh, Alex was found? Yes, I've driven that route numerous times. And uh, uh, you. You've seen uh, Exhibit 422, the map prepared by uh, Ms. Wright? Yes, I have. Right. And the route that's in dark blue on there, starting at 511 Cameron and going to E uh, 7614 430th Avenue, uh, is that the route that you have taken? Yes, it was. In your, based on your uh, driving that route and uh, uh, driving in the area, is there any other realistic route to take besides that route? No, that was the straight shot out there. And can you describe what that route is? So coming out from Alex's house, he lives on Cameron Street. As you're coming up to the stop sign at Cameron Street, 
Cameron Street actually continues up the hill and it merges with West Madison Street and it becomes Cameron Street. So Cameron Street then goes up over a hill, um, past a bunch of other streets, you come up to the intersection with Claremont Avenue. There there's a stoplight. Once you get past Claremont Avenue and you're heading outside of the city limits into Eau Claire County, it becomes West Cameron Street, eventually becomes County Highway E. And so you've talked about a number of streets. Is it is it just continuing on straight, or do you actually have to turn to get onto those various streets that you've described? It's one street, just changing names along the way. All right. And uh, so you've driven that route. Approximate, how long did it take you? Uh, did you time it? Actually, let's go back a second. Did you time the route at some point between uh, Alex's residence and the location where... Uh, his body was found. I did. And how long did it take you to drive that route? It took me 19 minutes. Right. Are there stoplights along the way? There are. And did you have to stop at any of those stoplights along the way? I believe the time that I timed it, I did not. I had green lights. I did run into traffic, but I tried to, I stayed at the speed limit. I wasn't going over it, just 55 until we hit, I believe it's the Dunn County, Eau Claire County line where it drops down to 45 miles an hour for a little bit as you go through Elk Creek and then back up to 55. All right. So you stayed at the speed limit the whole way? Yes. All right. Uh, now, you said you've driven that route a, a number of times. Uh, did you check, uh, based upon the uh, defendant's statement about a park, uh, to find out if there were any parks along that route? There are parks along that route. Can you tell us what uh, parks you've observed along that route? Sure. So Half Moon Beach is, as you come out from Alex's Road to Cameron Street, where the stop sign is and turns into Cameron, Half Moon Beach is right across the road. Half Moon Beach has a trail, a paved trail that leads to Carson Park. As you're going up Cameron Street, I believe it's on 11th Street, you can take a right onto 11th off of Cameron and Cameron Street Park is right there. As you can continue out on Cameron Street, once you get across Claremont, uh, Sherwood Creek Park is just off of that. It's about two blocks down off of West Cameron, I believe. And as you're continuing out now into Eau Claire Dunn County line, I believe in Elk Creek there's a park, but I don't remember the name of that one. Okay. Were there also other locations before 430th Avenue where you could turn off of uh, County Highway E after you get out of the city of Eau Claire? Yes. All right. And are there other farm type roads that you could turn off of as well before the uh, road that uh, the vehicle turned off onto. Objection, irrelevant. There's gazillions of roads available for anybody to drive in Dunn County or Eau Claire County. Are we really going to... Well, I'm going to overrule. I, it's harmless. Go ahead. You can answer. Yes, there's numerous farm entry roads or field entry roads to turn off of. Right. Now, uh, have you also had occasion to attempt to uh, walk uh, the distance from uh, the uh, where Al Alex's body was found to the Don Sipple residence. Yes, I have. And uh, did you do it at just one pace, or did you do it at more than one pace? I did it at two paces. I did a slow, sl slow walk, and then a brisk walk. Right. And if at a slow walk. How long did it take you to walk from uh, the location of the uh, where Alex's body was found to the Don Sipple residence? Uh, approximately eight and a half minutes. And at a uh, brisk walk? It was right around five and a half minutes. Now, uh, did you also have occasion uh, to uh, review the various Instagram accounts of, uh, or the the Instagram account of the defendant. I did go through it. Right. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. 
showing you what has been marked for identification and admitted as exhibit number 421. Can you do you know what that document is? This would be messages from Instagram. All right, and uh, those are messages between the uh, defendant and Jason Mangle from March 21st of 2018. Yes. And are you familiar with, uh, and if you've reviewed those, are you familiar with whether or not the message that appears to have been sent by the defendant at 938.11 uh, was the last message that she sent to Mr. Mengel on uh, March 21st? Yes, it was. And what is that message? My husband. So that's what the defendant sent to Jason Mengel on March 21st, 2018. Yes. Did you also have occasion to review uh, extractions from <coughs> the defendant's iPod? Yes, I did. And did you create uh, basically reports that contain some of the information from those? Yes, I did. Detective Proc, I'm showing you what is the mark for identification as Exhibit 691. Uh, can you tell me what Exhibit 691 is? That is an extraction report from the iPod. Right. And that relates to an entry that was made on uh, March 2nd of 2018? Yes. All right. And... Uh, And that would be an entry made by the defendant? It was on her iPod, yes. All right. Your Honor, I'd move the admission of Exhibit uh, 691 at this point in time. Is there any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. Exhibit 691 will be received. All right. And I'd ask to uh, publish it rather than putting it up on the Elmo. I've had 13 copies made. I would plan to hand them out. I want to ask a couple questions and ask the jury to have an opportunity to read that, okay? All right, go ahead. Is there a copy uh, for the court? Uh, I'm sorry, I... That's all right, I'll see it. Okay, I apologize, the, Your Honor. The actual exhibit. Do you have the exhibit? Or is, I do have, have the exhibit. So after, well, here, let me take a look at it here. Next one, I'm making an extra copy for the court, Your Honor. Thank you. That's all right. <laughs> so, Detective, in there, there is uh, some language and uh, where the uh, defendant is talking about, I can't have you talking about Alex. Do you see that? Yes, I do. All right. Uh, based on your uh, investigation, uh, do you know who that is referring to that she can't have talking about the situation with Alex? It would be Jason. And that's Jason Mengel? That is Jason Mengel. All right, thank you. Uh, Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I get an extra page of that. That was the only question I was going to ask. I'll just give the jury a little time to read that. Detective, I'm showing you what has been marked for identification as Exhibit 692. And can you tell me uh, what that is? It is an extraction report 
that was generated out of the notes section of the reader report that Detective Beardsley extracted from the iPod. All right. And again, that was the defendant's iPod? That is correct. All right. And uh, what is the date on this note? This note has a date of March 20th, 2018. All right. And uh, there are, it appears two notes on there. Yes, that is correct. Right. And two copies of, of the same note. Each one, there is a, two copies of the same note. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, what does the first note uh, talk about in general? Talks about a conversation that is that uh, Ezra had with somebody. And based on the context, do you know who that would be? Sidebar? Yeah, sidebar. Questions withdrawn. What does the second of the two notes on there uh, discuss? It discusses a conversation that Ezra had with Jenna. And that would be, as you understand it, Jenna Vandezand? That is correct. All right. And you were present when uh, Ms. Van de Zand testified yesterday? Yes, I was. All right. And uh, the conversation that's referred to in there, would that be the conversation that Ms. Van de Zand testified about? Objection, speculation, we approach. All right. That's fine. The objection is sustained as to speculation by this witness. Okay. Yeah. As, uh, All right, and I'm not sure if I have moved it, Your Honor, but I do move Exhibit 692 and ask to publish it. All right, Exhibit 692 will be received and it may be published. All right. I believe the jury has the copies. I'm not sure. Okay. And I apologize that happened before I did that, and that was my mistake, and I apologize for that, Your Honor. Apology accepted. Now, uh, Detective, uh, did you have occasion to also review the download of Alex's phone, uh, the extraction report from Alex's phone that was created by uh, Detective Beardsley? Yes, I did. And did you search that phone for communications between uh, the defendant and Alex Woodworth. Yes, I did. And were you able to find uh, the uh, find any communications between the defendant and Alex Woodworth? I was able to. Yes. I. Right. Uh, did in that uh, in those communications did the uh, defendant provide a name that she had for Alex Woodworth on her phone? Yes, she did. And what was that? Uh, she did not use Alex or Alex's last name. She referred to him as Bug Dad. B U G D A D. Uh, did you in those? Uh, find a an entry that indicated uh, or where Alex uh, asked the defendant if she was writing about anything. I believe there was conversation about writings, yes. And did she say if she was writing about anything in particular? I don't remember off the top of my head. All right. There are indications during the course of those writings uh, that they are involved in a sexual relationship. Yes, there was. And uh, when did those uh, text messages that indicate a sexual relationship, approximately when did they begin? Approximately begin, I believe, November, December time frame. Of 2017? Remember, of 2017. I don't remember the exact dates. And do they continue into February of 2018? 
yes, there is still conversation between the two of them into February of 2018. And is there uh, a request on February 23rd uh, from the defendant for Alex to call her? Yes, there was. Have you re did you review uh, Alex's phone and other materials to see if he initiated uh, any contact with the defendant after February 24th by any me electronic means? I did. And did you find any? Uh, there was no messages from Alex going out to Ezra on those dates that I saw. Now, uh, you testified there were a number of, of, of texts about the relationship between the defendant and Alex. On Alex's phone, did you review the defendant's iPod to see if those same texts were on her iPod? They were not on her iPod. Did you also, uh, after... Uh, hearing uh, some of the things that have happened in, in court here, have you attempted to search all of the electronics of Alex Woodworth that have been uh, extracted for references to uh, BDSM, bondage, discipline, those types of things? I did search his uh, electronics for those terms, yes. And did you find anything referring to any of those things on any of Alex's electronics? I did not find anything. Did you also search for things like knife play and edge play that we've also heard some questions about in the course of this uh, did, uh, trial? I did search for those words as well. Did you find any references to any of those things on any of Alex's electronics? I did not. Now, uh, did you have occasion, and I believe you testified you did, to interview uh, the defendant a second time? I did. And when was that interview? Uh, that was March 24th of 2018. And was that after then you had found uh, Alex's body? Yes, it was. All right. And where did that interview take place? That took place at, as well at Mayo Health System in Eau Claire. And at, that, at the time of that second interview, uh, did you have the ability or did you ask to see some of the injuries that the defendant uh, had on her body? I did. Which ones did you have a chance to see at that point? Um, during that interview, I was able to see the injuries on her left hand, uh, the three superficial cuts. I was also able to see the word boy and the scratches that were on her left forearm. Did you also see the abrasions on the back of, of her right hand as well? I did see those as well, yes. All right. Did you, or were you able to, on that date, actually see the injuries to her legs? No. Or her groin? No, I did not ask to see that. Being a male, I was not going to ask her to show me those sensitive areas. Full well knowing we had a female that was going to be there to take photographs of these injuries. Did you ask her, though, about any of the other injuries that you couldn't see at that point in time? Yes, she told me about the injuries to her right leg, the scratches, the groin area, and then she also, I believe, said she had an injury on her left leg around the knee. All right. And was that uh, an area that you're familiar with, the clothing that was uh, taken from the defendant uh, when she came to the hospital? Yes, I was. All right. And uh, you're familiar with the various... Defects in those clothing items? Yes, I am. And are you aware if there was a, uh, a cut or defect in the clothing items in the area of the left knee where she pointed to? 
I am aware there is a defect in the left knee, left inner thigh area, yes. Right. And did you also... Objection the knee or the inner thigh? I guess it's vague. It moved to... I, you know, I'll just cross them on it. That's fine. All right. So objection is uh, withdrawn. All right. All right. You may continue. Specifically, where was the defect on the on the left leg of the pants? And if you don't remember, that's fine. I believe it's the inner left thigh around the knee area. It's above the knee, but below the groin, so about in the middle. Okay. And uh, can you tell us whether the area that she pointed to was in the same area as where on her left leg was in the same area as the defect, if you if you know? She did point to that area, yes. And are you familiar with the photographs that were taken of the defendant uh, by uh, both Ms. Morris and uh, Deputy Merrifield? Yes, I am. Have you reviewed all of those photos uh, over the course of your investigation in this matter? Yes, I have. Is there any injury in that area? Not that I saw. Now, uh, where did you meet with the defendant for the March 24th interview? In Mayo Health System in Eau Claire. And was anybody else present with you at the time of that uh, interview? Uh, during that interview, investiga Investigator Conkey was in the room with us as well. Your Honor. You may. Detective, I'm handing you two uh, exhibits, exhibits number 289 and 290. Can you tell me first what exhibit 289 is? 289 is a DVD of DOJL, which is the interview that took place on March 24th, 2018 at Mayo Health System. And That's a recording of it? Yes, it is. Right. And what is 290? That is a transcript of this interview. All right. And uh, as I understand it, Exhibit 289 uh, has uh, scrolling text on it as well? That is correct, it does. Now, first off, did you review the original recording of uh, that interview and compare it to the transcript, which is Exhibit 290. I did. And can you tell us whether or not uh, that transcript is an accurate transcription of Exhibit 289? I believe it is accurate, yes. And did you review then the uh, scrolling trans uh, transcript that is found on Exhibit uh, 289 and make sure that that was an accurate uh, copying of that onto that recording? Yes, I did. And can you tell the, us whether or not it is? It is accurate. All right. Your Honor, I'd move the admission of Exhibits 289 and 290. I would ask to, at this point in time, uh, play that recording. It's approximately one hour and 22 minutes. All right. Mr. Nelson, any objection? No objection. Okay. Um, go ahead. And uh, do you want us to take the lights down at all during this? Uh, I think the lights are probably fine. We'll see once we get started, but I think they're probably fine. All right. And... Uh, Exhibits 289 and Exhibit 290 will be received, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Ezra. How are we doing today? Not so good. Not good today? Do you need me for anything? So, okay. okay. Thank you, though. You bet. Well, thank you for meeting with us again, or with me. Ezra, this is Brett. He's from uh, Dunn County. All right. So, again, thank you. Um, they shut the door for privacy. Just like every time we talk, if you want to be done talking, just let us know. Uh, I know you're here at the Inpatient Behavioral Health. You're in a locked facility for your for safety for to get you the help that we both think you need. But 
that door. It's not locked. Yeah. We'll end it. We'll walk you out. We'll get you to staff and get you back to where you need to go. Okay. Um, like I said, this is Brett. He's from Dunn County. Um, he's here as well to try to figure out what in the world happened. I mean, how you ended up at Don. I met Don. What's his last name? Spiggle. Spiegel? Simple. Sim simple. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So that's so that's kind of why he's here as well. Okay. So you know, yesterday we talked a lot about everything that happened on Thursday because today's yeah. Saturday. And I mean, I just can we go over Thursday again just to see if we can figure out? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's start with Thursday again about what happened. In the morning? Yep, let's start with the morning and end up, let's just go right, as chronological as possible, right up until, you know, the end. And then we can go from there until you basically get to the hospital. Does that sound, think we can do that? Okay. Um, so, Thursday, I was at my dad's house in the morning, and I got up, and I remember, I remember it. That dad called me to take care of the cat, so I had to do that that day. I kind of wanted to take care of the mail at the post office to transfer it, so I texted Jason about that. But I got up, and then I went, and I took a shower to get ready for the day, and then I got dressed and stuff. And then after that, I went, and I took care of the cat and the dog. And then after that, I went to go crab. My keys, so I grabbed my keys and the stuff I wanted to give back, and then I drove to Eau Claire. Okay. Yeah. All right. Your dad's house, is that where you're living now? Kind of. Is I'm that staying there for a while, a little bit. Okay, is that where, like, all your personal stuff? Go ahead and pause. I know that there's a portion here that's coming up where there's an address that's given out for Joe Shane Carlin, and I know Your Honor has previously made rulings about how, if at all, that should be presented in this case because of the unique circumstances, and so I just, that's coming up. All right, in the... I guess I just to add to, ask that the address be scrubbed, so to speak, uh, when that portion comes up. I can mute it to Okay, point. if you would mute that, that would, that would sure. accomplish it. It's okay. Also, if, if, if you're on the screen, I'm not sure how I, I there's not much way I can fix that, but if we can just um, direct it, uh, that not be... Okay, well, uh, the clerk can blink the screen, but okay. is it is it soon? Yes. It's at the 3.01 minute mark, and I'm providing my transcript to the clerk if it aids her. I'll just come back and get it. Okay, yeah, I can see there it says, where is your dad's house? Yes. So, and I think that should be That's fine. I won't obscure it. It's not and, necessary. Uh, the clerk can just switch off the screen, uh, and I'll, uh, as soon as it's passed, I will uh, advise. Okay. Okay? Very good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Nelson, for pointing that out. Yes. Is that currently? Computers, tablets, etc. Yeah. Where is your dad's house? It's in Stanley, I think. I'll let the clerk know when to put the screen back up. 317. Okay. All right. So you said you were bringing stuff back. Mm -hmm. What kind of stuff were you bringing? Um, a heating pad. Okay. And I was, I had like a few just like small things like a bookmark and stuff like that. Okay. Who was the heating pad for? For Alex because he gave it to me a while ago. I just didn't want it anymore. Okay. Because I didn't need it. Okay. And a bookmark? It was like a because he gave me a lot of like small like bookmarks and stuff like that. Who did? 
Alex. So you're giving him the bookmarks back? Yeah. Okay, how many bookmarks do you think you brought back? I think it's just one. Okay. All right. So is there anything else that you brought with you to brought or gathered to bring to Eau Claire? Not, no, not really, because I already gave back one of the books. Okay. And it was The Little Prince. But okay. That's all, really. Okay. So you get the stuff loaded up then? Yep. Okay, and then what happens? And then I drove to Eau Claire. Yeah. And I get to Racy's, and I see Jason's there, and Max, one of my close friends. Okay. What happens then? I say, Jason, I briefly say hi to him, but then Max says that he has, I had told him I have the painting for him that I painted. Okay. And he got really excited, so we went to his house to go exchange paintings because he gave me two paintings. Okay. Do you know Max's last name? Do you know where Max lives? Uh, not the address, but I know he lives in town. And town is in Eau Claire? Kind of, yeah, kind of by the ice rink. That's part of town. Okay. Do you know his phone number off the top of the head or his Instagram account name or... Yeah. What's his Instagram account name? Biggity. Big what? Biggity. It's like B-I-G-G-T-Y or something. I don't know how to spell Biggity, but it's oh. Biggity Biggity, so it's that twice. <laughs> Right. He's commented on a few of my things. Okay. And what is your Instagram name? Dirt. Dirt? D-I-R-T and then there's an underscore. Okay. And then F-I-N-D. No, F-I-E-N-D. Dirt Fiend? Mm-hmm. Okay. Something that nobody else would probably have. Probably not. It's really hard because the... Because Instagram is so big right now, you can't really pick anything, so you got to pick something really strange and random. That would be strange and random. Okay, so we meet up with Max. You give yep. him painting, you go to his house. Yep. And then after his house, we go back to Racy's to drop him off and stuff, and I looked for Jason a little bit, but he already left. Okay. To go, he had to do laundry that day, okay. so we probably went to go finish his laundry. Okay. And then after that, I went directly over to Alex's house. Okay, I went to Alex's house. What time do you think you went to Alex's house? Um, probably, I'm not really sure because I left my dad's house around 10, so it probably would, it takes like 45 minutes to get to Eau Claire and stuff, so it might be around 11 or something. 11? So about 11 o'clock you got to uh, his house then? Yeah. Okay. Was he home when you got there? Yeah. Okay. So... Walk me through it. So how did you get over there? I drove my car and I parked it, and I left it running because I didn't think I'd be in there long. Okay. And I just got the stuff from the back of my car, and I knocked on the door, but his roommate, Dave, answered. Okay, so Dave answered the door? Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened then? And then Alex came down, and I gave him his stuff, and he wanted to talk about things. Okay. So, where was where did everything where did the exchange of property take place in the house? Um, I handed him his stuff on the porch. Okay. And then he's we he wanted to talk and I wanted to talk a little bit too. So we went upstairs to go talk because that's where Dave is. His room's right next door. What do you mean where Dave is? Dave's bedroom. Dave's bedroom is upstairs or downstairs? Upstairs. So you and Alex went to go talk where? In his room. In Alex's room? Yep, because that's where my stuff was, was supposed to be. Okay. So you go there to talk to him, and you go up to his room? Mm -hmm. And who was in that room when you guys talked? Just me and Alex, but Dave was next door. Okay. And then, so you're talking in his room, you mentioned something about your stuff was yeah. supposed to be there? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Um, I had a yellow cup and, like, a blue hat and stuff that was that he had there. Okay. And he was just looking around for it and stuff while okay. I was talking. Okay. So you're in Alex's room talking. What were you guys talking about? I was talking about, like, I wanted to tell him, like, you probably might have been questioned or going to get questioned a heads up about the stuff between that happened between me and John and things mm -hmm. like that. And we were talking about that, and I was talking about kind of, like, my feelings about the situation and stuff like that. And he was just talking kind of about it, too. Okay, like, 
tell us more about like the conversation like how were you feeling and how was he feeling I was just feeling kind of like just a little sad because talking about it makes me kind of sad talking about the incident with John yeah yeah I'm just kind of talking about it and stuff like that and talking about kind of like asking like if he would know who's writing my number and stuff on the walls at races and crude things and I was like do you have any idea or anything I'm just like wondering like what's going on there because I was just confused like would you know who's doing it or like what's going on with that what do you mean they're writing your number and crude things um uh people have been <coughs> taking pictures of because someone I guess there's been a lot of talk about me at the coffee shop there and someone wrote my old number on the wall in the boys bathroom and wrote a really bad word above it what did they write? The F word and then me underneath. Okay. Well, that wasn't very nice of them. No. So, you're sitting there talking about to her, to our, sorry, sort of Alex about that stuff. Mm -hmm. What else did you guys talk about? Talked about kind of like my feelings and stuff about like when we kind of had relations together and mm -hmm. stuff. Like, how did you feel about it? How I felt about it and stuff. How did, how did that go? It would, see, for me, it seemed like it was going pretty well, but he was mostly kind of quiet. And he okay. seemed really quiet, but I was just kind of, like, trying to say, like, this is how I felt and stuff, and I just want to know, like, how you felt and things like that. How did you feel about... Um, I just kind of was, like, expressing, like, how I felt like it wasn't all that right, and how I've been writing about, like, the guilt of, like, it and stuff like that, and how things fell out between me and Jason a couple times and stuff like that. When you say you didn't feel it was right, what do you mean? Like, me and Alex, we've been friends for a while, mm -hmm. but also it escalated a few times to, like, it was more sexual at certain points and stuff like that, and I felt really uncomfortable and anxious. Was it, but were those times consensual between the two of you? Yeah, it just felt really wrong for me, really. Like, Afterwards? Yeah. I felt okay. really anxious, and it made me feel really, like, gross and, like, wrong and things like that. And I just was, like, wondering, like, did you feel anxious and stuff like that? Asking and things, and he said he didn't. Okay. He said he didn't feel anxious, he didn't feel guilty, or... No. How did that make you feel when he said that? Just kind of confused, like, I said, didn't you feel, like, a little anxious when Jason helped you with your cut on your arm when you cut yourself and stuff like that? And he's like, not really, no. So I just kept trying to talk about it, and he was just sitting there, just kind of like listening, and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you mentioned him cutting himself. What what happened there? It was a while ago when he did it, but he was out drinking because he drinks a lot at night, and then he went home and he cut his wrist and stuff, and then he texted me about it how he feels about it and stuff like that. He's talked about kind of like being overwhelmed a lot and okay. he talks about kind of like his kind of, he talked, he didn't talk much about his past, but he said a few things about like he used to do like self-harm and that he's been kind of violent towards some people, some kids and stuff hmm. when he was younger and things like that. And his parents. Did that kind of surprise you? Because kind of? when I talked to him, he seemed like a very yeah. mellow, laid-back kind of guy. Yeah, it really surprised me when he talked about it. And he talked about okay, I just, uh, and, and if you want to just go back to where I started to interrupt, but I, I think there's a, a need for a restroom break. So we're going to take a 10-minute a uh, recess. So 